Miracles, Part 1. Uh, we'll be discussing miracles partly from the viewpoint of a uh, book by Eric Metaxas entitled Miracles, what they are, why they happen, and how they can change your life. Um, uh, they're available in various forms, including ebook, which is probably the cheapest one. Um, I'm going to start with his definition of miracles because it's nice to know what you're talking about. Webster's Dictionary defines a miracle as, quote, an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs, end quote. More colorfully and memorably, C.S. Lewis once explained that a miracle is something unique that breaks a pattern so expected and established that we hardly consider the possibility that it could be broken. If for thousands of years, he said, a woman can become pregnant only by sexual intercourse with a man, then if she were to become pregnant without a man, it would be a miracle. Though we probably weren't expecting ribaldry from Lewis, his observation gets our attention. The skeptic and philosopher David Hume spoke famously against miracles but defined them as a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of the deity or by the interposition of some invisible agent. We may essentially concur with Hume on this definition, which is probably as close to a standard definition as we will be able to settle on. But I would further simply say that it is when something outside of time and space enters time and space, whether just to wink at us or poke at us briefly or to come in and dwell among us for three decades. Uh, my own words, it follows that miracles depend on there being something outside of nature. At least nature conceived of as a closed system responsive only to parts of that system and specifically not including a mind that responds to other minds. Now are other minds in nature? Well that depends on how you define it. Uh, the existence or non-existence of miracles is at the root of the atheist theist controversy and I might add of the intelligent design controversy. Now a caveat must be immediately made the logical, construct, uh, the logical structure of the ID argument does not require the intelligence to be supernatural. Uh, probably the best counterexample of that is Richard Dawkins uh, in his memorable passage uh, uh, in the movie Expelled. But when pressed by the logic, and I've seen this happen time and time again, uh, uh, intelligent design opponents invariably resort to complaining about to where the logic ultimately leads rather than being able to pick a flaw in the logic itself. One can argue all day and argue effectively that the logic does not depend on the supernatural. But if it eventually goes there, whether it depends on it or not, that is enough for these people to object. Uh, I'm going to go to a... Um, relative contemporary, a uh, fellow by the name of Adam Gopnik who wrote in the New Yorker in uh, an interesting article, Bigger Than Phil, in uh, the, uh, 2014. And it's available online in case you want to know about it. Um, Gopnik attempts to be sympathetic to both sides and points out that atheists can be quite religious. Uh, he mentions Jerry Coyne and his cats that uh, seem to uh, occupy a position that uh, for most people would be religious. And he mentions John Lennon, who was famously atheist, but who also embraced New Age uh, stuff that uh, kind of requires a belief in uh, something beyond nature. Um, and we get to kind of what the core paragraph is that he wrote. And here we arrive at what the knows, the people who think there is no supernatural. Whatever their number really have now, and that is a monopoly on legitimate forms of knowledge about the natural world. They have this monopoly for the same reason that computer manufacturers have an edge over crystal ball makers. The advantages of having an actual explanation of things and processes are self-evident. I think there should be a that in there somewhere. Uh, what works wins. 
We know that men were not invented, but slowly evolved from smaller animals. I want you to notice that where he turns to when he wants to make his case is evolution. That the Earth is not the center of the universe, but one among a billion planets in a distant corner, in spite of the fact that there's evidence against that assertion. And that in the billions of years of the universe's existence, there is no evidence of a single miraculous intercession with the laws of nature. You can pick your jaws up off the floor. Um, it's one thing to say there has never been a miracle. It's another thing to say there is no evidence whatsoever of it. That's just amazing. But I guess that's what happens when you have to have that kind of certainty that you simply pretend that the evidence doesn't exist. We need not imagine that there is no heaven. This is continuing with Gopnik. Um, we know that there is none. And we will search for angels forever in vain. A God can still be made in the face of all that absence, but he will always be chairman of the board, holding an office of fine title and limited powers. Gopnik is willing to leave him there as long as he doesn't do anything. Which means miracles are in the heart of this. You see, if there are miracles and God does do something. And it's interesting that with that perspective, he criticizes Stephen Meyer and his best-selling Darwin's Doubt, which uh, we've reviewed here before, which in his opinion reinvents the God of the gaps, a God whose province is whatever science can't yet explain, with a special focus on the unsolved mysteries of the Cambrian explosion. Experience shows that those who adopt this strategy end up defending a smaller and smaller piece of ground. It is perhaps interesting that Steve Meyer first wrote his book Signature in the Cell and then wrote Darwin's Doubt, meaning that f from Steve Meyer's perspective, he's defending a larger and larger piece of ground. They, people like Steve Meyer, used to find God's hand in man's very existence, and then in the design of his eyes, and then after the emergence of the eye was fully explained, yeah, right, um, they were down to the bird's wing. Then they tried the bacterial flagellum, and now, like Meyer, they're down to pointing to the cilia in the gut of worms and the emergence of a few kinds of multicellular organisms in the Cambrian as things beyond all rational explanation. I'm not sure too many of them have given up on uh, the eye <laughs> or man's very existence for that matter. But, you know, it's all in your perspective, I guess. Um, retreat always turns to rout in these matters. But you, you're getting the picture where he's coming from. Um, now, there's, there's one that's a little more... Um, uh, a little kinder, I think, and perhaps even a little more accurate because he realizes that some of the traditional arguments don't really hold water. And uh, this one is, a, uh, is actually a blog site from somebody at the University of uh, Wisconsin at Green Bay. The name is Steve Dutch. And uh, I have to credit this to Jeff Sonnenberg for bringing this to my attention. Um, and I'm going to go through most of it, uh, but not all of it, uh, uh, because it will give you another flavor of another way of looking at things and a way that I find attractive in certain, uh, in certain aspects. He gives a thought experiment. Consider a banker, a devout Baptist and complete believer in miracles. During an audit, he finds $100,000 missing. All the employers well, the employee's books balance. Is he going to accept that the $100,000 just miraculously disappeared? Is he going to expect the police and banking regulators to accept it? Not very likely. Even if all attempts to find fraud fail, he's going to assume that somehow somebody pulled off a theft. Now let's assume there's a witness, a long-time, highly trusted employee who's a member of the same church as the banker and whose character is above reproach. He tells the banker he was in the vault and saw the money simply vanish before his eyes. The banker is certainly not going to expect the police to believe this story or to blame them because they suspect theft. 
if all of attempts to crack the employee's story or to find the money fail, we have a lot of options to consider. Maybe the employee blacked out or hallucinated momentarily or had a small seizure. Maybe someone hypnotized, drugged, or distracted the employee momentarily and grabbed the money. Now, supposing the vault had a video camera that shows the money sitting in plain view, one frame, and gone the next. Our hapless employee is in the clear. Or is he? Could someone have interrupted the video feed for a second or two and then simultaneously have paused the recorder? Could someone have doctored the security tape? Could someone have fed a false signal to the camera system? Or, a la the old Mission Impossible TV series, use trick photography to fool the security system? I can't imagine anyone in banking, no matter how devoutly religious, not exploring every one of these avenues before concluding a miracle had happened. Even after accepting a miracle as the only logical explanation, I think this banker would always be prepared for the possibility of a natural explanation. The methodology here is pretty close to that of David Hume 250 years ago, who held that no evidence would be sufficiently ironclad to demonstrate a miracle. The banker wouldn't go that far, but he would explore every other avenue first. So why do so many people have a problem when science rejects miracles? Uh, notice the use of science in an uh, inclusive and non-defined way. Why would people expect the police to dismiss claims that money miraculously vanished from a bank and angrily label scientist skeptics for drawing the same conclusion about a tumor gone from a cancer patient? Partly it's pre prejudice that scientific theories, unlike $100,000 missing from a bank and possible prison terms for the bank employees, are really not of any practical importance, so what's the harm? It's very interesting the examples he gives. Actually, scientific theories are a lot more important than $100,000 missing from a bank vault, in literal money terms, let alone the whole issue of truth. At $100 a foot, a, a 20,000 foot well will run $2 million. That's one well. It makes a difference whether the fossils that turn up in the cuttings from the well were deposited according to the conventional views of geologic time or as a result of a miraculous flood. Wait a minute. Does it? I suppose there are some people for whom the geologic column is a myth, in which case it probably does. But I think most Adventists would say, no, it doesn't, because we don't disagree with the existence of a geologic column, we simply disagree with the interpretation. Um, but that's his example. Uh, it makes a big difference in money and lives whether we conclude someone's recovery in a $100 million clinical trial was due to the drug, the placebo effect, or a miracle. And that I would agree with. And this is emphasized by him. Science rejects miracles for exactly the same reason that accountants do when conducting audits, the police do when conducting forensics, and mechanics do when troubleshooting cars. The idea that we always seek natural explanations for phenomena is called methodological naturalism. It must be sharply distinguished from philosophical naturalism, which is the a priori assumption that only natural phenomena exist. It is perfectly possible to be a religious believer and still practice methodological naturalism, with one exception that he does not make, and that is methodological naturalism will hopefully eventually admit that it's possible, it's just outside possible if every other naturalistic explanation fails, and how badly does it need to fail, that we're looking at a miracle. The philosophical naturalism is precisely the insistence upon na uh, methodological naturalism in all cases. From the discussion above, we can draw two important conclusions ab about accepting miracles as explanations. All, one, all theologies that accept miracles admit they are exceptional events. That's what miracle means. Well, almost. It also means a sign, and that means that it needs to be theologically comprehensible. So if there's a possible natural explanation of a phenomenon, we go with the natural explanation. Again, that depends on how possible. Uh, 10 to the probability of 10 to the minus uh, 500 is that low enough probability. 
Number two, if you stand to gain from explaining something away as a miracle, you don't get to play. Now, I think he's wrong there. I think you do get to play, but what you have to realize is that you're playing with a disadvantage. That people for whom they don't stand to gain, uh, they get more credibility. That is to say, if you're from Enron, you don't get to claim your documents disappeared miraculously. It only happened if the FBI and the SEC said it did. Two, if you're a defendant, you don't get to claim your fingerprints miraculously appeared on a crime scene. Only the DA is allowed to say that. Three, if you're a bookkeeper, you don't get to say money miraculously disappeared from your company. If the auditors conclude that's what happened, all right, but not you. Four, if your religion needs to postulate a miracle to keep some doctrine from going south, guess what? You don't get to do that. Only someone with nothing to gain from the claiming of a miracle can say that, or at least say that authoritatively. Why some scientific statements about miracles are wrong. Now, you've heard some criticism of how a miracle is applied without insisting that it can't possibly happen. But you're going to find out he criticizes science, um, some scientific approaches to miracle as well. Instead of the paltry sum missing from a bank, let's think big. Imagine that tomorrow, precisely at noon Central Standard Time, Chicago simply disappears. Everything inside a sharply defined circle 20 kilometers in radius simply vanishes. Or the Chicago city limits, if you prefer. Um, Planes inbound to O'Hare Airport see the airport simply vanish. Pavement is truncated as if by a razor. Inside the circle, there are no basements or foundations. Countless people witness the event, and it is caught on video. In many videos, the frame where the event happens shows the change in mid-frame. As nearly as anyone can measure, it is instantaneous. Uh, clearly, we would have to conclude that something extraordinarily, extraordinary had happened something outside the known laws of science. The abrupt disappearance of a city as important as Chicago would have global impact. The effects would be so intertwined that it would be impossible to counterfeit the totality of the evidence. Assuming the evidence were preserved in sufficient detail, even the most skeptical observer a thousand years from now would have to conclude that something singular had happened even if the nature of the event was unknown. In an inquiry concerning human understanding, David Hume formulated what has come to be called the principle of minimum astonishment. He basically argued that no amount of testimony could suffice as proof of a miracle because the possibility of a fakery or fraud would be so much more likely. Hume used the example of a claim supported by many reliable witnesses of the King of England dying and being restored to life. If the alleged interval were short, it would be more likely that the king had really not been dead but merely in a deep coma. If the interval were longer, say a month, he would conclude the fraud was at work. It would be far more likely that the king and his courtiers would fake the death and hide the king for a month than that he could really come to life. A more commonplace hand example is claims of a perfect bridge hand, the player getting cards of only one suit. Lots of people have claimed to have seen or played such a hand, but there haven't been enough bridge hands dealt in the history in history to make even one case remotely possible. It's far more sensible to conclude that the witnesses are mistaken or the cards weren't shuffled well. Actually, this is an interesting case because somebody did have a perfect bridge hand. In fact, all four people got a perfect bridge hand. And uh, for those people, uh, it appears that what actually happened was uh, two absolutely perfect shuffles. Um, but that's an interesting um, uh, uh, to contemplate. Hume's position is sometimes summarized by saying that to prove a miracle, it would have to take an even greater miracle for the evidence to be faulty. Since we can never achieve that level of certainty, goes the argument, therefore there can never be evidence capable of proving a miracle. Well, of course, if you're trying to prove it mathematically, we've learned that we can't prove anything um, outside of mathematics, and there are some questions as to whether we can do that. Witness uh, Gödel and also uh, Lacatus. Or can there? 
As my thought experiment shows, Hume di simply didn't think on a large enough scale. You could hide the King of England and fake a funeral. What if London itself simply vanished? A more or less mundane event that is claimed to be a miracle could be faked, but what if the event itself is so far beyond the scale of normal experience that no imaginal, imaginable explanation of fakery would work? Perhaps even no imaginable method could produce the effect. Right off the bat, then, we see that one often made statement about miracles is flatly wrong. It is possible, indeed easy to imagine a singular event for which fraud is out of the question. And I might point out that um, uh, at the Great Judgment we might experience that event. Um, but what about less extraordinary events? Although fraud or error is possible explanation, being a possible explanation doesn't prove it is the explanation. Also, Hume committed a fundamental fallacy of confusing the evidence for a phenomenon with the phenomenon itself. Suppose in 2100, someone examines the claim that two successive golfers in the 2004 Masters hit holes in one in the same hole. The odds of a hole in one in the Masters are about 4,000 to 1. Figure 100 golfers per tournament and four rounds each with an average of 10 years between Holes in one, there were seven holes in one on that particular hole in 68 years, so it was about one every 10 years. The odds of two successive holes in, that w in one at that tournament and hole is one in 16 million, or one successive pair every 40,000 years. Our future analyst watches the videotapes, but video can be faked. He reads eyewitness accounts, but eyewitnesses are notorious for describing famous events they never actually witnessed. There are the newspaper stories, but once a news hoax gets rolling, it has a life of its own. The master's official statistics are maybe the most compelling evidence, but given a choice between the records being doctored and believing something happened that shouldn't happen before the next ice age, he concludes the story is a myth. The reasoning is perfectly sound. It has only one tiny flaw. The event actually happened. Hume is probably right in saying that no alleged miracle could ever be documented well enough to rule out fakery for all time. However, as the example above shows, charges of fakery can be used to rule out meal, real phenomena as well. Although fraud or error is a possible explanation, being a possible explanation doesn't prove it is the explanation. They have given a historical example. Writing off all alleged miracles as fraud is not only logically dubious and lazy, but it is proven to be historically wrong as well. The classic example is the case of meteorites, which were once dismissed by almost all scientists as fakes or folktales. When a meteorite fell in New England around 1800 and was described in the scientific literature, uh, was that peer-reviewed? Uh, the normally scientifically astute Thomas Jefferson said, classic Hume reasoning here, that he could more easily believe that two Yankee professors could lie than that stones could fall from heaven. Not long afterwards, a large meteor broke up in the atmosphere and showered a village in France with fragments. The evidence was on a scale that eliminated fakery once and for all as an explanation, and meteorites went from being folk tales and frauds to real phenomena. Well, at least went from being believed to be folk tales and frauds. Some conclusions. It is not hard to come up with scenarios where we would be forced to admit that some event wholly outside the known laws of nature has occurred. So it is flatly wrong to say that there could never be sufficient evidence for such an event. Allegedly miraculous events can be and have been cases of real but rare natural phenomena. So dismissing an event simply because it is alleged to be miraculous is fallacious. The event could be a rare but real natural phenomenon. Of course, in that case, technically it's not a miracle unless the timing is unreal. One possible explanation for any account of, any, of an extraordinary event is always that the event actually happened. Improbabilities can furnish us with good reason to doubt the event, but can never disprove it. We are, however, perfectly justified in demanding that the person claiming the event supply better evidence. 
Well, unless he's already supplied better evidence, in which case maybe we should, uh, uh, at, a, at some point we have to quit. Is the Chicago thought experiment definitely a miracle? No. One scientifically conceivable explanation that comes to mind is that there might exist physical processes that allow sudden translocations across space and time. Maybe pre-events Chicago reappeared in the Precambrian or in outer space or will reappear a billion years from now. There are theories taken quite seriously that space and time have extra dimensions, most of which are invisible to us because they close up on extremely short scales. Maybe space and time can close up on larger scales very rarely, and we just happen to witness one such event. Although, in, if it were to correspond with the city limits of Chicago precisely, it would make you worry a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe it happens all the time, but if one patch of empty space-time gets translocated to a different point in empty space-time, how would we know? Maybe it is only noticeable when the event impinges on Earth. Maybe we conclude from the fact that the circle is so incredibly perfect and sharp-edged that the event was the work of some incredibly powerful intelligent entity. A miracle? Or is the entity natural but merely extremely powerful? One needs only to recall the cargo cults of the Pacific, where tribes people thought that American World War II technology was supernatural. And within reason for their understanding of reality. Maybe this event is a real miracle, triggered by some conscious entity totally outside the laws of nature. But even if it is, even if a scientist personally believes it to be one, he will still be open to the possibility that he might be wrong although he could believe it enough to act upon it. And that an explanation within the laws of nature might just be discovered. Another historical example he gives of Benjamin Franklin and the lightning rod, and I'm going to skip over that except for the last paragraph. There were, of course, people who denounced this interference with what had been, once been divine. But as Asimov noted, People soon noticed that the local church kept getting hit if it didn't have lightning rods, and the local brothel, if it had lightning rods, didn't. For Americans, utility trumps ideology. And then he goes to Joseph Smith. An American miracle? One of my favorite test cases for belief in the supernatural is the tale of Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism. Smith claimed to have been given gold plates by an angel, which he translated to become the Book of Mormon. The interesting thing is that he showed the plates to witnesses who swore in notarized statements that they had seen them. That's actually true. Here we have an alleged miracle, not, 20, not 2,000 years ago in biblical times, but right here in the United States recorded in American legal documents. The interesting thing is here is that, apart from Mormons, most devout believers in miracles reject this account. And they do so for precisely the same reasons that most skeptics reject miracles in general. I'm going to say he's right on that, but not maybe in the way he thinks. Because they reject it, I think, most of the time on theological grounds. And I'm going to make a case that the skeptics disbelieve in uh, the miracles in the Bible and the miracles of Christianity for precisely the same reason. So it's not skepticism per se that annoys believers in miracles, it's skepticism directed against their miracle claims. And here we get down to the real reason most scientists reject miracles. Well, at least what he thinks the real reason is. Uh, the vast majority of alleged miracle accounts are untrustworthy. If you're inclined to take offense at that remark, Go look at any magazine put out by a religious denomination that accepts miracles, say, Pentecostal Evangel. Almost invariably, the magazine will require that an alleged account of a miracle be certified by a minister. Now note, they don't suddenly become miracles when a minister certifies them. That's just um, sifting out uh, ones that are likely to have another explanation. Out of thousands of alleged cures at Lourdes, the Catholic Church accepts only a few dozen as meeting its criteria for miracles. Why this skepticism on the part of religious bodies that believe in miracles? Because they themselves have found out the hard way that the vast majority of alleged miracle accounts are untrustworthy, 
even those claimed by their own adherents. Certainly these groups don't dismiss all dubious claims of miracles as frauds, nor should anyone else. A large fraction are probably ambiguous. If someone in a storm cellar prays to be spared from a tornado, his survival may have been due to divine intervention, but may also have been due to the fact that tornadoes have narrow paths, and I must also add, although he doesn't, uh, paths that change direction on occasion, and a specific house is a small target. Whether the tornado followed the path it did because of supernatural intervention is not something that can be tested by any known means. Although if it's heading straight for the house and suddenly veers off um, uh, uh, 500 feet away, you do, it does make you wonder. Um, there are certain classes of miracles that never seem to happen. Now here I want you to be thinking of possible exceptions to this statement uh, or exceptions to the class of statement. People have been alleged to be revived from the dead, but no decapitation victim ever has. Nor are there any reliable accounts of severed limbs regenerating. The fact that some types of miraculous cures are cited fairly frequently while others never seem to happen suggests strongly that other explanations are at work, at least in his opinion. C.S. Lewis in Miracles makes a rather similar point. He observes that biblical miracles are generally amplifications or reversals of natural phenomena and that miracles of the sort found in classical mythology, such as people turning into animals or inanimate objects, are absent. In Lewis's theology, miracles are rat rational events that are perturbations of normal causality, not the wholesale exceptions to it, of it. I think that's overstating Lewis, but whatever. Um, what can miracles tell us? Supposing through some as yet unknown line of reasoning, we come to accept that the disappearance of Chicago was a genuine phys miracle performed by some extra physical entity by means completely inexplicable, inexplicable in the terms of the law of nature. What have we proven? Surprisingly little, although earth-shaking for believers in naturalism. So far, we have proven only there is a supernatural realm that occasionally impinges on our own. That in itself is a huge step. We still know nothing about the entity that caused it. Was it God, Satan, or something totally outside of any existing belief system? Does this entity communicate with humans or make demands of them? The Joseph Smith example shows clearly that an alleged miracle has to be interpreted within some religious framework to have meaning. Without that framework, a miracle remains an isolated anomaly. In order for science to interpret something as a miracle, it would have to have some unambiguous criterion for distinguishing miracles from natural events, even those produced by yet unknown physical phenomena. This criterion would have to be objective and independent of any religious preconceptions. One way to achieve this goal would be to have a lot of data on miracles. But if miracles happened that often and showed that much regularity, would they really be miracles, or would they be phenomena that obeyed laws of their own? And thus, in some sense, natural. He has a point there. The no overlap theory, which he, as you'll see, will see, rejects. Some writers attempt to diffuse the tension between science and religion by claiming that they apply to non-overlapping domains. As conciliatory as that approach sounds, it can at best offer a truce. Either there is or there is not some entity in the universe that can operate beyond the laws of nature. If there is, then there can be occasional interventions not explainable in terms of physical laws, possibly even in contradiction to them. If there is not, then there are no omnipotent en entities in the universe. In addition, all, religious, all religions view their dogmas as factually correct, not merely morally binding. Well, I don't know about all religions, but certainly Christianity does. Inevitably, religions will make the claim that, uh, claims that are susceptible to objective testing. Again, maybe not all religions, but certainly Christianity. Uh, defining mutually exclusive fears of subject matter seems unworkable, and I agree with that. Instead, it seems more f uh, far more sensible to define domains of methodology. Science deals with phenomena that can be explored using the error-correcting method of science, methods of science. Replication and refutation are probably the most broadly applicable of these. Science deals with phenomena that can be repeated or otherwise verified. Um, 
Notice the comment, or otherwise verified, otherwise uh, geology would not be a science. Uh, yes. Well, I agree. I agree. Uh, if you rewind the tape, it will not come out the same way, according to Steve Gould, and I think he's right about that. Um, or was right about that. Um, science deals with phenomena that can be repeated or otherwise verified and which are potentially capable of being refuted. And so if you turn naturalism into a system, it is no longer capable of being refuted. Um, and uh, at that point, it ceases to be science, interestingly enough, at least according to uh, Dutch's uh, criterion. Religion has no right to expect science to accept a religious doctrine unless it can be subjective to scientific testing and unless religion is willing to accept that the doctrine can be refuted. And I would agree with that. If you're not able to make pronouncements that actually stand up, you don't belong in science. Um, religion is perfectly free to believe that event is a miracle, but it has no right to impose its assumptions on science. If it's a miracle, then of course science, uh, in a sense, you're taking it out of science. And um, Religion deals with phenomena that may be autonomous, that may be autonomous. It may deal with repeatable things as well. Uh, beyond human control, intelligently directed and volitional, that is, at the discretion of some conscious entity. Phenomena may or may not be manifested for reasons not connected to any physical constraints. So you can't put it in a lab. Information about the phenomena and the entity producing it might be co communicated in unique and non-replicable events. And that puts us in a very difficult situation, uh, which science doesn't usually put us in, although occasionally we have to have faith in scientists as well. Um, science has no authority to decree categorically that those phenomena accessible to scientific testing are the only ones that exist. <whistles> science cannot legitimately deal with religious claims unless it is prepared to admit the potential existence of autonomous and non-replicable phenomena. And there I would agree with him wholeheartedly. That is, if naturalistic science is incapable of dealing with miracle and should never claim that it has dealt with it and gotten rid of it. Moving on, what, why science can't accept miracles even if they happen? What? The oft-stated uh, oft claim that miracles are outside of science is true enough, but doesn't explain anything and merely makes science look arbitrary and closed-minded in the eyes of non-scientists. So it should simply be junked. Wait a minute. If it's true, why should we junk it? Too credulous belief in miracles can be a lazy way of dealing with any problem or explaining away any inconvenient fact, and that's certainly true. Can't see how evolution works, must be miracles instead. Well, that one's probably reaching. Although I'm sure the Dutch doesn't see it that way, and I think this is important for us to realize when we're dealing with these people, is this is the kind of way they look at um, uh, reality. Just imagine if accountants accepted miracles as explanations for discrepancies or the police accepted miracles as explanations for how fingerprints got on things. Even if miracles occur, they could only be accepted as such after the most rigorous scrutiny, scrutiny and I think that's fair. Anything else is an open invitation to intellectual anarchy. Moving on. Even if an unquestionably anomalous event occurred, not explainable in terms of any known laws of nature, we cannot rule out the possibility that the event is due to unknown laws of nature. Hume was right. No amount of evidence for a miracle can rule out the possibility of some hidden flaw in the evidence or unknown natural explanation. However, Hume made the unwarranted leap from miracles can't be proven to miracles don't happen. And there I agree with him wholeheartedly. Skipping on, a second principal reason why science rejects miracles, therefore, is that writing something off as a miracle forecloses any possibility of explaining it in other terms. I don't think so. 
I think you can assume that it's a miracle until proven otherwise, uh, rather than uh, rather than making it to where proving otherwise is impossible. Even if, th through some unknown means, we establish that an event is genuinely miraculous, we are left with an isolated anomaly that tells us nothing. Well, not quite nothing. It does tell us that there is something that can create miracles and that naturalism is dead. Just because a miracle is reported by a member of some sect doesn't mean the event supports that sect's interpretation. And that I would agree with again. The fact that something is possible doesn't mean we have to regard it as likely. I may get hit by a meteorite, but I don't spend time dwelling on it. A miracle may influence the course of a disease, but most religious believers will still go to the doctor. The ones who have the courage of their convictions and reject all medical intervention usually die. Well, the ones who have those convictions and have the courage of their conviction. Now, my take on all this, I think there's a lot of truth in what Steve Dutch says. He seems to concede a lot of ground to believers in miracles. He does, I, in my opinion, miss one point. In the end, all belief in miracles and also all disbelief is theologically influenced. And in some cases, theologically determined. He wishes to say that disbelieving scientists are somehow more objective than the average people. And that may not be true. Uh, for good, bad, and ugly reasons. Um, and one example of that particular statement is a famous statement by uh, Richard Lewontin in uh, the New York Review of Books, which is available online. I highly recommend the uh, article in total because what we're doing is we're taking a, an excerpt out of it but it is kind of the key excerpt. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations no matter how counterintuitive, and he lists that uh, ahead of time, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, that's where we usually quit, uh, cut the quote. But I'm going to continue beyond that statement about the divine foot in the door to uh, the rest, uh, the end of the paragraph. The eminent Kant scholar Louis Beck used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. Of course, as we know. Um, People who don't believe in God will oftentimes believe in anything. Just look at John Lennon. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. The big threat, the reason we can't let the divine foot in the door is because we might have miracles. Interesting. And then... There is uh, Metaxas' book, Miracles, quotes G.K. Chesterton in Orthodoxy in a passage that is worth quoting in this regard. But my belief that miracles have happened in human history is not a mystical belief at all. I believe in them upon human evidences as I do in the discovery of America. Upon this point, there is a simple logical fact that only requires to be stated and cleared up. Somehow or other, an extraordinary idea has risen that the disbelievers in miracles consider them coldly and fairly, while believers in miracles accept them only in connection with some dogma. The fact is quite the other way. The believers in miracles accept them, rightly or wrongly, because they have evidence for them. The disbelievers in miracles deny them, rightly or wrongly, because they have a doctrine against them. The open, obvious, democratic thing is to believe an old apple woman when she bears testimony to a miracle, just as you believe an old apple woman when she bears testimony to a murder. If it comes to human testimony, there is a choking cataract of human testimony in favor of the supernatural. If you reject it, you can only mean one of two things. You reject the peasant story about the ghost either because the man is a peasant or because the story is a ghost story. That is, you either deny the main principle of democracy or you affirm the main principle of materialism, the abstract impossibility of miracle. You, can, you have a perfect right to do so, but in that case, you are the dogmatist. It is we Christians who accept all actual evidence. 
It is you rationalists who refuse actual evidence, being constrained to do so by your creed. But I am not constrained by any creed in the matter, and looking impartially into certain miracles of medieval and modern times, I have come to the conclusion that they occurred. All argument against these plain facts is always argument in a circle. If I say medieval documents attest certain miracles as much as they attest certain battles, they answer, but medievals were superstitious. If I want to know in what they were superstitious, the only ultimate answer is they believed in the miracles. If I say a peasant saw a ghost, I am told, but peasants are so credulous. If I ask why credulous, the only answer is that they see ghosts. Iceland is impossible only because, stupid sailors have se uh, because only stupid sailors have seen it. And the sailors are only stupid because they say they have seen Iceland. Um, and I think that's an important point. In fact, we are dealing with something where the evidence is on our side. The denial that such evidence even exists is done for theological or if you prefer anti-theological reasons. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Got a comment up here. This minute, let's hand the mic up. What was the reference for the item by uh, Steve, Steve Dutch? Um, do you, you get the email? Yeah, is it in there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's that's the second reference in the email. Oh, okay. <coughs> It'll also be the second reference, I think, on the, um, uh, we'll have all of the references in the, um, uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, they'll be all there too. We're trying to keep this all there as much as possible. Uh, I have a, just a little bit of concern about uh, Dutch's approach uh, in that he uh, seems to insist that science is re replicable. Science is what? Replicable. Uh, it seems you have to be replicated and so on. You have to be able, that is part of science per se. Well, I, I would uh, agree with him on that. I, I, yeah, well, I would not. Uh, okay. You just go to cosmology. Uh, how are you going to replicate well, Big I Bang? Well, I think cosmology going... is quasi-scientific, and well, I think the same it, thing is true for geology. It, it, you can't replicate that, and that means it, that it doesn't have the same authority as physics does. Well, uh, geology is considered science, and so is cosmology. Yeah, uh, but it's a different kind of science. I mean, even, uh, you know, Steve uh, Meyer will point <coughs> this out, that you can't use experimental science on geology. You have to yeah. use uh, uh, what is called historical science, which is not uh, the same thing. But historical science is science. I mean, you have to include historical uh, science in science. Do I mean, really? A awful lot of science is historical. Uh, in fact, but it, it uses different rules and it does it, not have the it, same uh, authority. And so I'm, it, I'm really, uh, I'm kind of tired of people who are saying that, that uh, uh, evolution is a fact just like gravity is a fact. <laughs> because they're not established with the same kind of evidence. But so many people refer to geology as science and so on. I yes. think we need to include it. Yeah, well, but you include it with the caveat that it does not... Um, I mean, even evolutionists will tell you that evolutionary biology is the uh, stepchild of physics. And people have sometimes called uh, uh, <coughs> evolutionary... say that evolutionary bio biology have physics envy. But evolution is considered science and it's non replicable well, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, but just on that point, I mean, what about the idea that you're not, you're not going to recreate the actual event, but maybe you could do high energy physics that demonstrates that <laughs> that historic event was maybe possible. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, and or, I think, or, or like you I could, think you that's can one do reason why it doesn't be deserve to be completely. Um, removed from the arena. So you, you can't reproduce it, but you know, for example, we can go to lab and maybe we can do some selection and be able to show some basic evolution, at least yeah. microevolution. Right. 
Right. Um, and so, you know, maybe you could, I think it's a bit of a stretch, but maybe you could say, well, if it happens at this level in the lab, then maybe you can extrapolate it to some, you know, dinosaurs <laughs> become birds sort of thing. Yeah, um, but you always have to re recognize that it's not the same thing as physics. Right. And, I mean, whether you want to call it quasi-science or you want to call it... Um, uh, historical science or something, you need to make a distinction. They're, they're not the same. They don't have the same authority. Right. They just don't. And that's a really important point I mean, for us to get through. Hmm. Biology, we can see what animals do today. If you're trying to do the biology of, um, uh, let's say, Australopithecus, you're out of luck. The best you can do is find bones and hope that they tell you a little bit of something. Um, but the story they to tell you is heavily, um, it will be heavily covered over by your belief in how old they are and what they represent and so forth. I mean, if, even if you could find DNA and clone Australopithecus, Pith 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 is it? Yeah, um, yeah. Then, uh, and you put them on an island and you study them for thousands of years, uh, and lo and behold, what we think historically happened does happen again. It still doesn't prove that that's actually what happened in the past. That's correct. That's correct. And that's, that's the weakness of historical science, or quasi-science, or however, whatever, however you want to label that. I don't care the labels. What I care about is the actual fact. And the fact of it is, whatever that stuff is, it does not have the same authority as physics. And the evolutionists know it. Okay, talking about historical science, how, what do they say about predictions the Bible has that, uh, you know, that they come, have come true? Well, of course, this guy doesn't deal with that at all. I, know, I noticed it wasn't, yeah, in the talk at all. Um, and, you know, if predictions came true... Maybe that's too at scary. At a certain point, you start to say, well, maybe there's somebody who knows more than we do. Because that would have to be considered a miracle since there's no explanation for it. Yeah. Um, again, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of resistance. Some of that resistance will be fair because, you know, there are predictions that really haven't exactly come. I mean, if you read Ezekiel uh, about uh, chapter 40 on to the end of the chapter, you have a res restoration of Israel. That hasn't happened yet, and um, I suppose could theoretically happen, but it's doubtful that it will happen in exactly that way. So you do have those kinds of pictures that you have to, that you have to deal with. But on the other hand, uh, you have some amazing things that have, that have uh, taken place um, in the life of the Messiah, and Daniel's prophecy being one of the clearest ones, yeah. um, which is why people who don't want to believe in the Messiah generally don't study Daniel 9 very closely. I, I think those, that's one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is, has legitimacy. Yeah. And at that point, yeah. you're starting to say, well, maybe that particular argument will hold water. It's kind of a, a, you know, a preponderance of the evidence. That's and, right. You know, it's, I mean, that's right. And I don't think God ever forces us to do anything without... Right. Uh, I mean, I don't... I, I think that all of this stuff can be denied if you really have a reason to deny it. And since it's it's not like, well, you know, uh, what team will might win? You you got such of a, a chance there. But I mean, when you're talking about hundreds of years and all these changes, I mean, you can't logically or just guess, uh, be get lucky or whatever. I, you know, that's well, just you can believe in God or you can believe in luck. I guess <laughs> uh, at some point, to me, luck kind of runs out. It's it's logic, I think. Uh, he had a question. Yeah. We have a comment in the back. Um. I was just impressed when they were going through, and I'm sorry, I don't. I think it was your last author. Their objections, or it may have been Dutch, their objections to religion, conclusions for miracles, and yet I was plugging in evolution, and and every time for origin of species, we keep stretching and stretching to try and come up with theories that will work, can't prove them, and they don't work, or the probabilities get, what, 10 to the minus 24th, and, and, or whatever. And um, 
So it seems to me if they just turned around and applied their own statements to origin of species and evolution, they would defeat themselves. They, they, or they would at least admit they have to be theological to agree with them. Because it, I just kept plugging in evolution every time they were saying religion in that section, and it seemed to fall right down with what they were doing and accepting as far as evolution was. Uh, and I think it's arguable that they're having a harder time than we would. I agree. Did you have a comment? Um, I can't recall now who actually coined this phrase, but it goes like this. More is true than can be proven. Yes. And I think he recognized that, by the way. That being the case, and that is always the case, and the reason why that's the case... Because nothing can be proven except well, mathematics. This is another problem, but the other thing is, even, even, even as we struggle to demonstrate things, prove or counterprove some things, there will always be some things which will be outside of our control information comes at a price. It is not cheap. It is not there just for us wanting it. You know, that's true not just in terms of religion. It's true in terms of physics. It, it, it's true in, in terms of all knowledge. Yeah. Information does not come simply because we want it. I read... I don't know if I heard here or read just recently <coughs> that they did uh, some research on peer review. And I, mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to be a little vague on this, but I think somewhere around 75% of that's not reproducible. It depends so it seems on to me like, study, um, but yeah, you're right. I've, 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 I've seen 25% seen seen reproducible in some studies. Uh, particularly in terms of, I think it is um, psychology, and I and in, amazingly enough, in well, cancer research, you on think people be extra I careful. Uh, there's one, there's one situation where they tried to repeat 40, uh, 53, what they considered landmark studies, and 47 of them could not be yeah, reproduced. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the same thing. I think. Uh, uh, well, you know, and that leaves you with uh, that leaves you with the whole question of you know what do you believe and how. So it's starting to look like maybe even physics isn't as good as we think it is. We have a comment here. Somewhere recently, I'm sure it was in one of our papers, perhaps the review. A story was told of a small Adventist interaction with the public, the ladies in the kitchen soon realized there would not be enough lasagna to meet the need. They prayed and did not run out of lasagna. Praise the Lord. And I want to say, well, that sounds like the miracle at Cana. Uh, and, and Shouldn't we bring this group to the GC to vote, to, to, to work on the budget? Um, well, the other question is, does that prove that the cheese and lasagna is perfectly good to eat? <laughs> but I was amazed that there was no comment on the story. It was just a little story and left there, and uh, I still don't know what to make of it. Well, it's very interesting, because one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, some of the miracle stories by uh, Eric Metaxas, and he's going to tell stories who, uh, where people took the theological point to be that their theology was basically correct in certain areas that, uh, that I would have a little more trouble with. Um, what do you do with those? Well, it must be the devil. Uh, except that these people don't seem to be particularly devil-possessed. Um, and I think sometimes we're going to wind up with difficulty explaining. That's one of the places where I think Dutch is correct. The fact that it's a miracle does not prove that your theology is correct. Uh, there, in standard Christian theology, there's a devil that can do things. But more importantly, God seems to 
be with people specifically and praise them for their uh, works and everything and sometimes even go along with uh, what they're saying in spite of the fact that their theology isn't exactly right. I give to you two examples, one of whom is John the Baptist, of whom there was none born uh, of women greater than he. But he was confused as to why Jesus wasn't doing what he thought Jesus ought to do if he were really the Messiah. So obviously he had a partly erroneous con conception of the Messiah. The other example I'll give you is Apollos, and he's preaching mightily and apparently healing people as well. And Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and say, well, there's a little more that you need to understand. So the fact that it, there is a genuine miracle does not prove that the person who had the miracle is theologically exactly right. Uh, yes, uh, uh, um, comment there and then behind you. Yeah, regarding the reproducibility issues, I think that such studies may f fall into the uh, problems of <laughs> methodology, uh, which is frequently discovered when you have multi-center studies where you have several different labs trying to follow the same procedure. And they're not really. And they're not really because everybody is doing, even though it says the same thing, you know, you know the way cooks can follow the same recipe and come out with different things. They don't taste the same. They don't look the same. You know, things just don't work out the same with different hands. Well, I've, I've, I worked in a lab for before I went to medical school. Uh, by the way, I should probably note that it's just about 11.30, and I know some of you people need to be somewhere else, so uh, consider this your invitation if you need to leave. But the rest of you are welcome to stay. Um, I used to be, I used to work in a lab, and we found out that methanol from Mallinckrodt would work. But another one would. But another methanol, which has the same basic purity and everything, just loused up the, uh, the assays completely. <laughs> and to this day, we don't know why, but hey, we're, you know, if it works with Mallinckrodt and it doesn't with the other, we buy Mallinckrodt and that's it. That's right. So, you see, there are many unknowns which are generally overlooked. And if you just follow the recipe without realizing that, you may certainly not be able to reproduce something, not yeah. because there is something uh, malicious or fraudulent about the original work, simply because there are other <laughs> confounding factors that have crept in. Yeah. I think that uh, as we look at this issue of what is a miracle, or at least uh, was that a miracle, it uh, behooves us to be f hold a fairly high standard before we call it a miracle. Uh, too often, I think, uh, people attribute a miracle uh, which is not. I think this probably is uh, a weakness among religious groups that religious groups need to watch carefully about. Now, uh, you know, uh, mathematically it's been stated, and this can be a cliche, that, you know, one chance out of 10 to the 50th is uh, considered impossible. Anything beyond that is considered impossible. It's, Borel's law. Yeah. Uh, uh, obviously an arbitrary number, but uh, uh, I do think this raises a fairly high standard uh, as to what you're going to really consider a miracle, and uh, mathematically it, it gives you something to go by. Right. Uh, on the other hand, I would caution that uh, if it is less than that, uh, we should not arbitrarily say it is not a miracle. But uh, uh, when it gets into these higher figures, we have to recognize miracles do happen. And uh, you, I mean, you logically, you may call it science or not science, that's a, a definition issue. Uh, 
that it, uh, these things that are so rare do occur uh, tells us that logically, hey, there's reasonable uh, factors, there are reasonable factors to say, hey, no, this does not fit with my chemistry, does not fit with my mathematics, does not fit with my physics. Uh, and I have to admit, hey, miracles do occur. Once you open that door, of course, uh, it can change your whole uh, world view. Uh, and I think there's good data for that. On the other hand, I think we need to be cautious and not attribute everything that just abnormal as a miracle. Mm -hmm. Well, just, I guess just following up with that, I, I guess I wonder for those of us who are Christians and scientifically trained, might we consider miracles, if, if we sort of scrutinize things that are attributed to be miracles, might we be skeptical and therefore less likely to expect miracles, less likely to pray for miracles, less likely to think miracles are going to happen, whereas perhaps our Christian friends who are not so skeptical, in fact, do pray for miracles more often, maybe receive miracles more often? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, how skeptical should we be in those situations? Obviously, there are some, there are some frauds. Um, you know, what percentage of them are frauds? And the other thing that's very interesting is, you know, you, men you notice that he mentioned that what ha happens if it's reproducible? Well, according to the accounts we have, Jesus' miracles were reproducible. That is to say, people could reliably go to him and, you know, if they were sick, they would be healed. If they were lame, they would be able to walk. Um, it was it was something that happened reproducibly enough that you know you got the feeling that there was something there that well if you want to put it that way is quasi scientific hmm. now of course there's also the record that in certain places he couldn't do many miracles because of their unbelief so apparently it's not absolutely 100% and the record seems to believe that there's that that faith has something to do with it but not always because there's no record whatsoever that Lazarus had enough faith so that he could be raised from the dead especially uh, when he was dead yes <laughs> <laughs> somehow that that doesn't fit and uh, you know he was saying well people who are decapitated never get raised from the dead well if you have if you have a situation where somebody is rotting enough to where they stink, that would seem to be pretty close to the decapitation point. Um, and the amazing thing is Jesus heals him. He walks out. There's no record of, but his leg fell off at the knee. <laughs> you know, apparently when he came back, he came back Complete. basically 100%. In fact, I've read about somebody who had his eye restored in the city of Roseburg, Oregon, which has been recently in the uh, news, although I'm told it's really supposed to be Rossburg or something like that, but uh, uh, who had his eyesight restored and uh, after having a bad accident, I think it was, and the cornea that was replaced was absolutely clean. So maybe Lazarus came back better than normal. Um, we do have a uh, record of amputated ear being restored. That is true. It's not a head, but it is right. an ear. So when you hear people say those statements like that, well, there's never been a decapitation, take it with a grain of salt. They probably never heard of one. And frankly, at this point, I haven't either. Um, but there are cases that are somewhat parallel. And, and also, we've never had a case of somebody traveling to Mars. Doesn't mean that they couldn't go to Mars. Lack of evidence isn't proof that it can't happen. Um, that's particularly true in the pre-1969 era for the moon. 
Of course, that was all faked, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, yes, comment. In my work, I teach students from various countries around the world. And when they're in class with a bunch of American students, largely Adventists, some of their experiences don't come up because we're obviously so skeptical about things like ghosts or miracles and that sort of thing. But when you talk to people from Haiti, for example, or from Vanuatu or from some tribal regions in other places, they talk more openly about miracles and things that have happened in their cultures and more about uh, spirits that they've seen and the realities of voodoo and things that in our culture we just we're so skeptical that we either they never occur or we never acknowledge them and uh, it's just interesting to hear other people who are good Adventists with completely different views about things that would be miraculous. Yeah, if you want to get an earful on that, uh, talk to Elaine Fleming. Uh, she grew up in a, uh, you know, as a missionary's kid in a culture that, and, and it's just, it's unbelievable the kind, well, it's unbelievable to the standard conditioned Westerner, let's put it that way, the kinds of things that she has seen and heard personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I agree with you. I think that, uh, well, more is true than can be proved. <laughs> yes. Um, can yeah, go ahead. And uh, it then struck it me that this author was uh, proposing the loss of 100,000 in cash out of the uh, vault. I was thinking it might be more interesting of a ex mental experiment if uh, knowing that the door to the vault was only, say, a yard across, but that you somehow suddenly got there in the morning and discovered a cube of, say, yard and a half of something solid in the middle, say, solid gold, say, or solid whatever. Disappear? No, or appear. Appear, yes. Yes, you, yes. you suddenly have a solid block a cube of, say, yard and a half, so you know there is no way it could have come through the door. How are you going to explain that? And you look at it, and there are no joints where it looks no, like it's been put together. And solid yeah. piece. And well, you can, th that reminds you can me take samples and study it to your heart's delight. Yeah. That reminds me of the story that I heard of once of a, a body that uh, seemed to have gotten through locked doors. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Haiti, and with reference to your comment about uh, people of other cultures, uh, uh, I felt privileged to uh, be there and see certain things that you know I attribute to, to being miracles. In fact, uh, I was so glad that I did that because when I was faced with some serious uh, challenges from evolution and so on, when I went to the University of Michigan, I, I, f I felt, well, man, these folks, they haven't been to Haiti. They haven't seen it. They don't realize that there's a reality there beyond what they were uh, willing to admit. And uh, among the things are devil possession. Uh, Natives talking in German under possession. I mean, this this really boggles your mind. N natives whose native language is French. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Creole or Creole. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, people uh, jumping 15 feet up in the air. Women so strong under possession that five men could not hold them down. I've seen this with my very eyes, folks. Uh, to me, there's no question there's, there's a reality beyond our uh, uh, limited uh, scientific ethos at present. 
one more comment and then maybe we can save that one for we'll be doing miracles again so you'll uh, <laughs> the, we don't have to exhaust the subject today it seems like this brings up basically a fundamental human problem that of uh, well you could actually make a good case that we don't know what the heck we're talking about because people make so many errors human error there's human errors you know and human perception can be so flawed uh, you could actually make a good case that we really could almost question 90% of what we think is facts because, you know, what, what the, f who knows, maybe in the future we'll find out a lot of other things that will defute most of our so-called facts that we believe now. It's, fundamentally, it gets down to a belief system of ours that we, we trust our, our senses, our sight, our hearing, but we know all those things can be, you know, fooled. We can, there's optical illusions, there's all kinds of things that can affect our hearing, our other senses, and definitely our thinking and our brain is, as in being influenced by belief systems of all kinds. So, and, and even more than that, what we have not actually witnessed, we will put through that filter. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. That we do not have all the answers, and, uh, and I don't think we're going to get to them by the end of this discussion either, but uh, we'll have some more fun next week. So come on back. <laughs>